All righty. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi there. Welcome to the Yukon Foundation's event series about plant-based living benefits. Today is our first panel discussion in this series. And what we're going to do is highlight the medical effects that accompany a plant-based lifestyle from the faculty at Yukon Health. I'm Jillian Wanick, and I'm your moderator today. I am currently an assistant professor in the dietetic program in the Yukon uh, campus out at Stores. I have a doctorate in clinical nutrition and I'm a registered dietitian. So I work as an educator and I also work as an inpatient dietitian. The favorite part of my job is that I get to work with a team of healthcare professionals that deliver interventions that positively impact health outcomes. And today we're gonna to focus in on the fact that food is medicine and plays a key role in chronic disease prevention. So I'm looking forward to our, our talk this hour and I'd like to have all the panelists introduce themselves and our first panelist is going to be Brad. Thank you so much, Jillian. Um, my name is Brad Biscup. I'm a physician assistant. But, um, you kind of think about my history. Literally, I'm a farm boy from Nebraska, so corn country, so I'm used to eating a lot of beef back then. Um, ended up with a master's in exercise physiology, came back to, uh, moved to Connecticut, started working osteoporosis and exercise cardiac rehab. And as I was going through the education process, one of the clinical uh, requirements was to go to uh, either cardiac rehab or some type of preventive medicine and ended up in Colorado doing the Pritikin diet back in the 1980s. And that was one of the very first diets that really focused on plant-based nutrition. Um, ended up going to PA school after being in Connecticut and started the lifestyle medicine clinic within cardiology in 2010. Um, so I'm certified as a lifestyle medicine specialist um, and very similar to Jillian is being able to understand how we use the nutritional component, especially plant-based whole foods, to treat different diseases. And for my specialty, I really focus on getting into the, when we look at the diabetes, the cardiac patients, how can we help them um, with their cholesterol and blood pressure? So that's one of the funnest parts of my job. And I will pass it over to Dr. Brewer. Hi there. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Jillian. Um, Molly Brewer, I'm a gynecologic oncologist, which means that I care for women with gynecologic cancers. Um, I'm also chair of OBGYN um, and a professor um, in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And my interest in this, well, I've had a lifelong interest in, in uh, in lifestyle, um, healthy lifestyles. But my real interest started about hmm, probably 10 years ago, I started to notice that I was seeing younger and younger women with endometrial cancer, that's uterine cancer. And there's a very strong association with uterine cancer and diet, um, body mass index um, and lifestyle. And it has to do with not only what they eat, but how do they, how do they manage their lifestyle? Do they exercise? Do they have high caloric intakes? Um, if they have high caloric intakes, what makes up that caloric intake? Is it mostly carbohydrates? Is it mostly protein? Is it mostly plants? Is it mostly vegetables? Is it mostly coming from, um, you know, meats? So, you know, I, I got I got interested in this, and so when I started to I started to see these young women who were in their mid twenties to mid thirties, and they were coming in with endometrial cancer, with uterine cancer. And I, and, I, I, and I started to say, you know, what, what's going on? Because it was a big shift. It used to be a cancer that we saw primarily in women who were in the menopause years, so over the age of 50 to 55. And there was a strong, there's always been a strong association with being overweight. But part of what we're seeing is we're seeing these young folks that are obese from childhood. And they have they have high um, carbohydrate diets. And so they begin this whole cycle of increased carbohydrates, which increases their insulin. They develop what we call insulin resistance. And eventually most of them develop diabetes, but even before that, they develop this insulin resistance and they don't feel good if their sugar isn't high. 
Um, and so they eat a hard carbohydrate diet and insulin kicks in. Um, it increases the movement of glucose into the cells and all of a sudden they're hungry again. And so, you know, because these are broken down so quickly and part of what happens with uterine cancer is this starts this whole inflammatory pathway that causes an increase, basically an increase in estrogen and estrogen that's unopposed um, and it stimulates the uterus to proliferate, in other words, to grow. And they st usually, most of them stop ovulating, um, or if they ovulate, they only ovulate occasionally, so they don't have the protective effect of progesterone. And so part of what I started to try to understand was how to, not only from the cancer perspective or the pre-cancer perspective, but also from the lifestyle perspective, how could I start to really treat these women? And the more I looked into this, the more fascinated I got because um, you know, what happened you know, years ago, all of a sudden people said, you know, don't eat fat. And everybody stopped eating fat. And instead of eating fat, they started to eat carb carbohydrates. And the more carbohydrates you eat, the more you crave. And so it really becomes this kind of the circular thing. But, you know, what I've found is it's very, very difficult to change people's lifestyle. Most people want a pill, they want um, a fast fix. And so, you know, that's a lot of what I talk about with my patients is, you know, this is, this is, a, this is, a, lifelong, this is a lifelong effort. And I also tell them that this is a sentinel cancer. So breast cancer, colon cancer, and endometrial cancer run together. They're common pathways, common um, denominators. And so I say, you know, you developed an endometrial cancer most of the time curable, but this may not be curable when you get your colon cancer or your breast cancer. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of my interest. Um, and it's, I'm really passionate about it because, you know, I, as I say to them, diet and exercise. So anyway, I'll pass it on to Dan. That's great. Uh, thank you, uh, Jillian, for, uh, over, uh, for emceeing this meeting. Um, my, my name is Daniel Rosenberg. I'm a, uh, HealthNet Chair in Cancer Biology and Professor of Medicine at the Health Center. Um, before that, I spent uh, almost a decade out in stores in pharmaceutical sciences. I have a PhD and a master's degree in environmental health sciences toxicology. And that's the type of work I did really in stores before I came to the health center when I began to translate more into cancer prevention. So my, my, real, my real interest is in chemo prevention, which sounds scary, but it couldn't be less scary. It's basically applying uh, natural products, whole foods, um, and even very, very non-toxic health supplements, uh, even aspirin, things of that nature to preventing, primarily in my area of research, colon cancer or other GI cancers. So we've been working for the, the past two decades on coming up with, with novel strategies to prevent uh, risk of colon cancer. And most recently, and really related to this, this fascinating um, panel discussion uh, on plant-based approaches to health is our recently launched study of walnuts and how walnuts can actually um, prevent various diseases such as cancer and also uh, we believe forms of ulcerative colitis or inflammatory bowel disease. So we've launched a trial, uh, really a biomarker study, uh, which you'll hear a little bit more about shortly. Uh, we've recruited about half of the patients so far. And the, the, the most difficult part of the study is you have to actually eat two ounces of uh, whole shell California fresh walnuts every day for three weeks and collect all sorts of dietary records and information, provide us samples of um, fecal samples, urine, blood. And finally, the, the, uh, the most exciting symbol clash of, the crash of the study is you get to have a colonoscopy. <laughs> everybody looks forward to. And that's done by uh, primarily by Dr. John Burke, and who's the chief of uh, GI at the Health Center. And also Hallie Bazzeri has been doing a number of the colonoscopies as well. So we're very excited about this, this study and how we think we can identify 
mechanisms by which walnut and the constituents in walnuts can actually reduce your disease risk. We've also done some work on black raspberries, uh, w which are loaded with something called anthocyanins, and we're really interested in these antioxidants and how they may suppress reactive oxygen and oxidative damage. Uh, we've, we're looking at a number of different modulation, manipulations of diet, primarily in rodent models of cancer that we study. Um, one of the things we're interested in is folic acid uh, and what we call methyl donors or one carbon metabolism and how we were recently funded the study from NIH to study how methyl donors may influence um, the activities of chemotherapeutic agents. Uh, so we have a number of different areas of, of translational research focused on primarily on prevention and use of natural products for preventing cancer. Thank you. Great. Thank you to all our panelists who I know have incredibly busy schedules and have, have stepped away from both their research and their clinics to be with us for this hour. So I'd like to start with Brad. Brad, can you give us a rundown of, of why plant-based and, and what are some of the disadvantages that some of the fad diets that are currently out there that are very high in animal proteins have on your health in both the short and the long term? I think when I'm thinking of the nutrition component, the, you know, when talking about foods, my mindset when I sit down with that 52 year old female is how can I help her get to be 100, so 40, basically eight more years without disease. So that's my mindset initially when I'm going into this. It isn't a quick fix. Um, and that's why when you look at the longevity studies, uh, you know, and the blue zones, these are longevity centers throughout the world. There's five of them. And Okinawa, Japan, Loma Linda, California, the Seventh-day Adventist, the island in Greece, Ikaria, Sardinia, as well as Nicoya Peninsula. What are they doing? Um, you know, and that's why when I'm sitting down, I look at the different markers, like Dr. Guru was saying with the insulin, that's, I track that. Um, and then being able to talk to them about specifically what their diet is. And when I can show them the glycemic load, the sugar effect of the foods, and they learn that the plant-based foods are so much lower in that carb effect, the sugars, and how that really kind of cuts down on their appetite. They feel much more satisfied. Um, and that's why when I'm looking at, you know, a patient individually, um, especially when you get into the patients with renal failure, you know, the kidney patients, what type of, you know, food is helping change their labs? You know, I one guy, his creatinine was 3.9, almost on dialysis. We got him down to 2.2 in about three years making changes. So when I'm looking at longevity, looking at the food, and you look at the long-term data with animal products, especially you get the high protein animal fats, the inflammation, you look at the cancer risk, heart disease. Um, so that's why when I'm looking at the whole picture, I'm not looking for a quick fix. Mm -hmm. One thing I don't focus on is weight because if I know I can focus on them eating healthier, moving, Controlling their stress and eating well, they will meet, meet a much healthier weight when I get into that. Great. And Molly, could you add some thoughts to that perhaps with your patients specifically and the link to diet programs and cancer? I know in, our, in your intro, uh, you uh, started to allude to some of the aspects where uh, diet impacts the incidence and progression of these um, um, cancers. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think, I think Brad's right, you know, I, it's, it's not a quick fix. And I think that, you know, having patients understand that, um, you know, they're responsible for their own health um, is really important. And that, you know, their, their habits, you know, from the time they're young, to let's say in their 50s is going to determine what the next 50 years of their life is like or whether they even live that long. Um, you know, plant-based plant -based foods, um, a lot of them are actually high in fats and people, you know, I hear people all the time say, oh no, that's high in fat, but these are good fats. Um, you know, fat is an integral part of your diet 
And the fats particularly that you get from plants are, they're healthy. They're also, they also are usually high in vitamin A and some of the other, some of the other cancer preventatives. Um, and, you know, we know that they prevent colon cancers as well because, you know, it's the, it's the high meat, high meat animal fats that actually contribute to colon cancer and we think probably contributes to uterine cancer. Some of the other cancers I take care of, it's not so clear that there's an association, um, but this one, there's a, there's a very clear association with what you eat and how active you are through the day. Um, you know, and I agree with Brad, I don't focus on women's weight. I just take care of women, obviously. I don't focus on their weight. I help them focus on their fitness. Um, and I say, you know, you, you know, diet is an integral part of this, as is exercise. Excellent. And Daniel, I know you, again, in your introduction, started talking about the role your research was taking, looking at gastrointestinal diseases, um, both the ulcerative colitis, the inflammatory bowel, and the colon cancers. Can you give us a little bit more about your walnut trial and how that is working? Sure, sure. I, before I forget, that, you know, Molly brought up something which is just fascinating, which is the early onset incidence of, of the endometrial. And before I forget, the, one, of the, one of the most uh, pressing concerns right now at the NIH and is the huge increase in early onset of colorectal cancer. And it's becoming uh, so important that there's a specific grant uh, funding announcement right now for proposals to study early onset in colorectal or any, actually any cancer um, endometrial as well. So we just put in a grant um, with one of my collaborators in stores, Dr. Charlie Giardino, who's in uh, molecular cell biology. We've worked together for many years. So we just submitted a grant to try to understand the basis of the, this early onset. Um, we want to get at the, the potential for intervention and prevention of early onset. We don't know what age is going to be most critical where this, why there's this epidemic right now in early onset, At what age does it begin, where, where can you reverse it, uh, but we're really interested and maybe walnuts will be the answer. So we're running a trial, we're about halfway through right now. Um, we're hoping to follow this trial then with a larger uh, trial that's targeting uh, very high risk patients that already have presented with advanced adenomas in their colon, but that, that trial um, is being uh, reviewed right now at NIH and we're waiting to hear what happens. It was almost funded about four months ago, very close, but it didn't get funded. Um, so the trial right now is really uh, taking healthy volunteers and this study is being run in collaboration uh, with uh, my, my longtime colleague at Jackson Laboratories, uh, George, Dr. George Weinstock, who's a microbiome uh, a, a world-renowned microbiome expert. And the purpose of the study is to look at how walnuts affect a number of different biomarkers in the, in the gut, including your microbiome. And where walnuts are loaded with, with all kinds of uh, protective uh, constituents. They have a lot of gamma tocopherol, vitamin E, which is a very healthy form of vitamin E. They've got tons of fiber and they're loaded as as uh, as as uh brad and, and molly have been talking about they're loaded with fat but they have a very very healthy uh type of fat they have something called ala or alpha linolenic acid a lot of it and in fact of all the tree nuts the walnut has the best ratio of what we call omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acids so they're they're a very healthy source of fat what we're interested in is something called the lagitannins in walnut. And walnuts are a very rich source of elagitannins. And uh, as are pomegranates, berries, uh, mushrooms, there, there are other places to get uh, elagitannins. Walnuts are a, a very good source. And what we're studying is how elagitannins are converted in your gut, primarily by the microbiota, into urolithins, which are a 
family of antioxidant molecules that are fairly understudied at this point. They're becoming very hot, a very hot topic, and there's more and more papers coming out on urolithins. But we're really interested in these in a, in this class of molecules, the, these antioxidants that are generated from elagitanins in your gut by microbiota. The interesting thing is that not everybody can make these elagi uh, these urolithins, and it really depends on your constituents of your gut microbiota. And working with a group in Spain, uh, Juan Carlos Espos, we've, Espen, we've, we've actually uh, begun to try to understand why individuals vary in their ability to make urolithins. And Dr. Weinstock and I are trying to figure out the specific microbes that might be responsible for making urolithins. And if you're missing them, the idea is that through a uh, probiotic type approach, we could actually introduce those gut microbes into your into your microbiota and give you the ability then to make these important molecules, which we think are very, very potent antioxidants, uh, anti-cancer agents, et cetera. So basically the patient comes in, they're consented to be in the study. Uh, they have a one week period of washout, we call it, when they have to abstain from urolithin containing foods. And then for three weeks, they eat about two ounces or a, a handful of walnuts a day they provide urine, fecal samples, and blood before and after the three weeks. And at the end, they have a colonoscopy when they provide eight biopsy specimens from four from their upper colon and four from their lower colon. And we're putting all this data together. Uh, the, some of the work is being done in stores by uh, Anthony Provadas, who's a, uh, a, a analytical chemist in the Department of Chemistry. And he's measuring all the urolithin metabolites right now. We've gotten about half done so far, uh, 26 patients, and we're finding an enormous range in your capacity to make urolithins. And Dr. Weinstock has found that people's microbiota is extremely variable in this capacity, and we're beginning to associate certain microbes with your, with your ability to make these urolithin antioxidant molecules. So again, we have about uh, 25 or 30 patients left to recruit. The very few exclusions other than nut, nut allergies, and you have to be between 50 and 65 years of age. So we're taking all comers. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Daniel. And I, I would just love to add a few comments. I do have some background in studying the Mediterranean diet. During a normal summer, I would bring students to Italy to study the Mediterranean diet and its role it plays in both our health and the environment. And really there is extensive literature looking at Mediterranean foods, plant-based foods, and the potential health benefits. And again, the Mediterranean diet varies from place to place, but one focus is plant-based foods. And as Dan was talking about, the elagic acid and its metabolite, urolithin, getting a, some new vocabulary, all of us today. But these are phytonutrients. These are chemicals found in plants that we really are, just as Dan said, beginning to understand the importance of. And there are over 4,000 phytochemicals and, and really we're just scratching the surface there. So plant-based foods, it includes not just the healthy nuts with the healthy fats that Dan was talking about and Molly, but also the fruits and the vegetables and seeds and nuts and even some whole grains are still um, acceptable for those of us who are trying to stay away from processed carbohydrates. And it's really the nutrient density of all these foods is, is where we're seeing the benefit. And there's so many components, those phytochemicals, like Dan was talking about, Molly or Brad, we're both talking about the vitamins, um, the antioxidant vitamins, the vitamin A and E. And we're not sure at this point about which is the best. Dan, Daniel says walnuts are the best. <laughs> I'm a walnut fan too, but really it's a combo of protective um, you know, foods. So food base, as Brad had mentioned in the beginning of our lecture. And really one of the other big benefits is the fact that all of these foods we've been talking about have uh, fiber. And really um, there's been several trials looking at 
um, something as simple as consuming 30 grams of fiber a day um, and the role that can play in helping you lose weight, improve your blood pressure, and um, improve your overall health. And uh, to Molly's point, improves your response to insulin and, and not really anything that's too complicated at all, something that we all could, could do. What I was hoping to do now is um, come back to our panelists and talk to Brad really about food labels and, and I'd love your thoughts on how we should read and interpret food labels, Brad. Great. Um, thanks, Jillian. And one thing um, when I think of the and anatomically the small intestines when you're talking about the plant-based nutrition, there's a reason why our small intestines about 23 feet long, it's made to spend that time degrading the food. Um, and so, and that's why when you get into, you know, the healthiest foods, we should have to chew them a while. We should have to put a little bit of effort into breaking them down. How that comes into the food labels, and this is where it's so, we're very good at confusing the public. Um, when we look at food labels, we talk about the fats, we talk about the carbs. Um, and then, but we're not talking about, you know, true healthy food. You know, the number one thing that is never on a food label, which is just as important as all the other macronutrients, is water. We look at the water concentration. We lose that, and that's why understanding how the water and fruit, how that helps dilute it so we don't get that quick absorption at the beginning of the small intestine, because the water primarily isn't absorbed until the end of the small intestine. Um, but as far as when you talk about the fats, the complexity, because if we think of animal-based fats, the butters, the lard, they're solid at room temperature. Well, guess what we are? We're solid at room temperature. So when we are having those animal-based fats, it's very quickly absorbed into the small intestine, goes into the liver, and there goes your LDL and triglycerides. There goes that inflammation that's happening. Um, so when I'm drawing, you know, examples to patients is so they understand when we're looking at those plant-based fats, the olive oil, why are they better? It's the complexity of them, which then we have to break that down to convert into what we are. And that's similar to the carbohydrates. The analogy I use with carbohydrates is we have bricks or chimneys. The glucose is a brick that can be absorbed very quickly. That chimney, that fiber, the complexity of it, it takes a long time to break down that complex carbohydrate, which then, like Molly was saying before, to stabilize that blood sugar. And then they don't get the craving. So that's where the glycemic load of the food is so much better. So usually I, you know, when I look at labels, um, I do look at the protein and the fiber, uh, especially the fiber is the most important thing for me, especially cardiovascular wise, because like Jillian was saying, if I can get 30 grams of fat, that can lower the LDL almost 30%, uh, which is as effective as some of the older statins. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I break down labels a little bit differently. I don't really get into the sugars. I look a lot with the glycemic effect of the food, which takes into consideration the whole food, not just a carb, not just a fiber when you break it down. And the fats, so I really look at the ingredients and I say, where is this coming from? Um, so when I see the plant-based as the main source of the fat, I'm not nearly as worried because usually that's going to be much more anti-inflammatory. Um, but if I'm seeing a protein source coming more from an animal-based, then I know that's going to put more stress on my kidneys. It's going to be more inflammatory overall. Um, so you know, I try to keep the simple analogy of if it goes bad in four days, it's probably good for you. <laughs> it's natural. It doesn't have any preservatives. Um, and I think the more we can look at a label, but be careful what's in that label. So really looking at the ingredients is probably one of the most important things. Molly, I know you talked briefly about sugar in the diet. Any additional thoughts on uh, simple carbohydrates and, and your patient population? No, that, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think I'll just um, kind of tag on to what Brad said. You know, a lot of it is um, the more complex it is, the healthier it is. The longer it takes to break down, the more time it takes to actually be absorbed and go into your bloodstream. And, you know, what, what people... 
I think fail to understand or, you know, they, they say, well, all carbohydrates are bad. Well, actually all carbohydrates are not bad. In fact, things like pasta, things like brown rice, things like black rice, things like some of the, some of the healthier things that we see in some of the Mediterranean diets, for example, and some of the other diets are actually very healthy carbohydrates. It's the, it's the, it's the sugar, it's the, um, um, it's the cookies, it's the bread, it's the, um, the things that break down very quickly. And you know, those are the things I think people have to be careful about because they, once you kind of get on that, um, that endocrine imbalance, if you would, you start to crave, in fact, what's not good for you um, and what's going to promote just, it, it kind of becomes a circular thing where um, the more you eat, the more you want to eat, and the more you the more you want to eat, the more you eat, and um, and that's partly where you know the 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 weight goes on. So you get increase in adipose tissue, adipose tissue. One of the questions that came up from from somebody was, why do women not cycle? Well, because they have all this unopposed estrogen because fat tissue actually makes estrogen. So when you have an excess of fat tissue, you have very high estrogen. And what estrogen then does is it goes back and it increases your testosterone. Um, testosterone then increases your, um, some of the insulin receptors in the ovary, for example, and basically shut it down because you have a high androgen, uh, uh, basically uh, high androgen um, environment. Um, so, and th but this is all linked directly back to diet. And, you know, the thing about plant-based food, I don't think you have to eat, I think you can eat things besides plants and be very healthy, but it's a matter of balancing everything. It's a matter of, you know, eliminating the simple sugars, um, eliminating, or at least being, being circumspect about too much in the way of animal fat. Some animal fat is fine, but for example, substituting olive oil for butter, um, substituting um, some of the seafoods for um, beef. Um, again, everything in moderation. That's the other thing I tell my patients is, it's all about moderation. It's all, it's not calorie counting, but it's being very aware of what you eat. And you know, the other thing that I know is most people don't know how to cook. And they don't know how to, you can, you can live on a very small amount of, of money a week, you know, eating beans, eating um, vegetables, you know, these are not expensive. It's the processed foods that are expensive. Um, and so I think even more, it then becomes, how do we teach people to go a little bit back where we were a hundred years ago or 200 years ago, um, where we make more things ourselves, for example, because if you make it, you know what's in there. Um, you can't tell a lot by reading labels and labels are notorious for um, misleading you. Um, and so again, you know, it kind of goes back to, this is all part of good health. Um, taking care of what you, what, what, what you put in your mouth is gonna determine to a large degree, you know, what your lifespan is and what kind of life is that? You know, my patients, by the time they see me, you know, they've had joint replacements. They're so heavy that they've broken down their joints, so they can't exercise. Um, you know, they get their knee replacement and then they can't exercise because it hurts. Um, you know, and so it, then it becomes really this, again, it's a circular pattern. And I think what we have to do as dietitians, as physicians, as PhDs, as nutritionists, we have to educate people about Again, it's a healthy lifestyle. Excellent. And I, I do know it's really only the past couple of years that labeling those added sugars has become mandatory on our food label. And we're gonna talk about heart disease and cardiovascular disease prevention in our, our next question. But I know that there has been research done in um, Open Heart Magazine um, excuse me, journal that has showed that folks that do have um, more than 25% of calories from added sugar are at a threefold increased risk for cardiovascular mortality um, compared to those who keep their added sugar intake to less than 10%. 
So it really does matter, um, again, what you are putting into your body. Let's see. So going on to cardiovascular prevention and treatment, I was going to say either Brad or Daniel, um, any thoughts on um, the best lifestyle medicine for the prevention of our, our number one chronic disease? Brad? <laughs> I'm doing my wheelhouse. <laughs> um, the first thing I want to tag on to Molly real quick about, you know, the cost of eating healthy. When you look at the poor man's nuts, sunflower seeds and beans, explain it, it's, you know, very inexpensive. You can buy a pound of sunflower seeds, the kernels, unsalted for right around $2.99, if not less. Um, and the, you can definitely find that. It was funny because I was doing a lecture on lifestyle medicine and cancer. And someone gets up and asks me about the lectins within the beans, you know, look at their cancer risk. But my feeling is, okay, so if beans are so bad for us, why are they, they they're literally the number one food that determines how long we live. It's the complexity of that food. That's what I think we're getting with a lot of this is just, it's so complex. And that's why our body has to work so much at breaking down the food, which I would much rather have my intestines break it down than letting the inflammation get in through the rest of the body. Uh, cardiovascular prevention. When I'm talking to patients, when I'm going through their diet, I always do substitutions. I'm looking for foods that they like that are good for them. Mm -hmm. So that way, if they bring in a list, we're looking for the, the nuts. And when I talk to them, the first thing I talk about, if you could take a pill that's going to reduce your risk of having a heart attack or cardiovascular disease 27%, would you take that? There's your one ounce of nuts every day. There you go, Dan. <laughs> it's two and ounces those, I, and that's why looking when they kind of well now i know why i'm taking it medically then they're more likely to do it and, um, and i think looking for those type things when we talk about the fiber content you know avocados and i think a lot of this is when you're having that discussion is what do you think of you know different foods are you worried about the sugar and fruit um, and we discuss it. And then I show them what's the data on long-term cardiovascular prevention with fruits and the vegetables. Um, when you look at the risk of red meat, um, as far as cardiovascular disease, just similar to what you were saying, Jillian. Um, and so when I'm looking at prevention, primary, secondary prevention for any cardiac related issue, I'm very specific for treating that cause. So if it's diabetes, I'm really looking at that insulin sensitivity to follow that and how well is the plant-based diet doing for them as well as the activity, as well as stress management and sleep. Um, because when I'm looking at their overall risk, it's not just the nutrition. You know, I'm using all the different things that I can within their lifestyle. And a lot of people forget about the mindfulness and the stress, how that affects your insulin sensitivity as well. Um, so I think for overall cardiovascular prevention, I use the analogy, keep it simple for success. And the more we keep the food simple in the natural form, the best food plant-based really can help us more. But I don't expect my patients to be perfect. I want them to have a steak if they really want it once in a while. And that's, I think, with the Mediterranean diet, as you see, they're not perfect. They're not all plant-based all foods, especially the blue zones. They run about 80% plant-based. And but that's kind of when I'm sitting down and talking, those are the important things for me. I'm glad, I'm glad Brad brought up a really important point. I, I kind of wanted to mention it, which is the, the idea of um, taking out of the complex food, the whole food, individual components and making a magic pill. And, you know, the, the walnut work, we're, we're, the, the current walnut trial, which is funded from American Institute of Cancer Research, in Washington, also from California Walnut Commission, is kind of asking this question in really great detail right now, which is, what's the best approach for the for the patient, for compliance, and for everyone's health? Do we want to take an allergic acid pill, which you can buy at GNC, or is that ridiculous? It's better to take the entire whole food which has all the other stuff in it 
in some amazing, you know, ratio of, of healthfulness. And I'm of the feeling like Brad, obviously, and Molly, that it's better to, to take the whole food, get all the plant-based nutrients in it, uh, take all the benefit that nature's giving you, rather than trying to take a simple fix and find a specific uh, agent in it that you think is going to benefit you when you're going to miss everything else. But it is a huge discussion. Pharmaceutical companies want to develop um, magic bullets, and I don't blame them. That's, that's where they go. Um, and it's difficult for them to get into the whole food world because it's too complicated and there's too many different substances in these foods. But really, um, you know, you probably need to have the, the entire uh, nutrient complex present at the same time in some fantastic natural ratio. Yeah, I just, Jillian, I wanted to go back to something that, that Brad was saying. I, one of the things in terms of cardiovascular disease is the, and this is something I tell my patients with endometrial cancer, is women who develop endometrial cancer, if they don't change their lifestyle, um, they, the majority of them will die of cardiovascular disease within five to eight years. And so, you know, again, these are all, you know, mine is the cancer world, but you have the cardiovascular world, you have um, other worlds, you know, they're also interrelated, um, similar risk factors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I really like what everyone's been saying about the whole dietary pattern. And especially I think when we talk about cardiovascular disease and, and look at again, fat and um, now the role that sugar plays in cardiovascular disease because of its inflammation, its insulin resistance. It is important, I think, always to talk about all the different types of fat. And so really, I think for a long time, we were on a train of misinformation on the saturated fat. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, the pendulum has swung the other way to the fact that we are not um, linking saturated fat, having it cause heart disease. Um, it's considered a neutral fat. But that being said, the um, foods that Dan talked about, um, not just the walnuts and their specific component in it, but all of the unsaturated, the poly and the monounsaturated fats, those definitely have shown over the um, past decades um, that they're substituting um, in, in, a meg in an overall diet does show um, reduced risk in cardiovascular disease. And, on the same way as Molly was saying, the um, you know the added sugar and a poor diet quality absolutely shows that you can um, increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. So, really, just as our, our one of our final questions, because we want to get to our panel audience, um, any thoughts on uh, the role of uh, of exercise um, and um, adding that into the plant-based diet. I think any of our panelists, any thought on that? Molly will touch on this actually. Uh, mm -hmm. I am actually a member of the clinical um, exercise committee for exercises medicine through Marin College Sports Medicine. So I use the exercise as medicine. So I'm like what we're saying about how do you increase insulin sensitivity with exercise? So that's when I talk to my patients. Is it going to be the duration or the intensity? And that's, you know, the duration is more important as far as intensity for increasing that insulin sensitivity. And that's what I look for. I look at those insulin changes with them. Um, and as far as the exercise component with, you know, when you're looking at the community, physiology of producing the LDL and triglycerides. Triglycerides are basically being converted over to the LDL. That's the main component. So if you're able to utilize those during aerobic type exercise, that's how you can drop that LDL. And if you do a little bit higher intensity exercise, then you'll have a little bit better effect on increasing the HDL. Um, and so I'm very specific when I set up an exercise prescription but it's got to be with what the patient is doing. And I always use the 50-10 rule. So when I set up an exercise prescription, they have to meet the goal of 50% of the time for that week, and then we go up 10%. If they can't reach it, then we go down. 
Um, and it could be dancing with your grandchild twice a week for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. It could be, and that's why the variety, letting the music move you when you stand up. And that's why I think the creativity now is, you know, the new guidelines in 2018 say we just need to move more. Mm -hmm. Number one thing, having a standing desk, taking the stairs, you know, you don't have to do high intensity interval training, just walking for an hour can reduce the cardiovascular risk for women almost 50%. Mm -hmm. That's a week, an hour a week. So I think we, a lot of times when we set the guidelines, we just look at the guidelines and we don't, we forget about the person themselves. So exercise, oh yeah, trust me, all the cardiologists know, you say exercise to everything. <laughs> I can treat and prevent over 40 different diseases. I think it's one of the best medication we can use if we use it effectively. Right. Right. And, you know, what I find you have to do is um, you have to find kind of what you were saying, find an exercise that they like, you know, find an, I say to them, you know, walk 10 minutes a day and then next week walk 15 minutes a day. And then the next week walk 20 minutes a day. You know, you don't, it, it, don't, don't go out and try to run a marathon when you're not fit, but, you know, start slowly. But the, the key thing is you, you've got to keep it up. And you've got to keep it up consistently. You know, it, it becomes kind of like brushing your teeth. Um, it's part of your day. You know, it's like drinking your cup of coffee or, you know, other things that you do on a daily basis. And, you know, it just, I, 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 go, I push my patients every time I see them about exercise. Um, I suggest some of them can go to a gym. My cancer patients, actually, this is, for those of you who've had cancer and might be in the audience, um, Many of the YMCA's have these Live Strong programs. They're free for cancer patients, um, and they can kind of get people started in exercise. So I, I recommend those. Um, I recommend you going to work out with a trainer. Um, I recommend you know biking, walking, swimming, um, running. I mean whatever whatever they can find to do. Um, so I, that's a lot of my talk with patients is exercise is really the key to longevity. Can I make a quick point on that? And that's where, you know, Molly, that's exactly right. And then giving them specifics. So just like what you said, you know, because my patients always get a to-do list. It's written down just like a prescription. Um, you know, going for a walk with your grandchild twice a week for 30 minutes, put it on your calendar to give it that much importance, that credit. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. And I mean, really tying it back into the situation that we're all, um, you know, living with right now, there really is this growing body of evidence that indicates that obesity is strongly and independently associated with adverse outcomes for the COVID-19. And, and really, I think if you could combine, you know, the knowledge of um, plant-based meal patterns and um, including some exercise, it gives each person in the audience today and, you know, all of your, you know, family, friends, and neighbors a, a really easy, actionable, preventable intervention that you could do um, at each meal and this, you know, even modest reductions have profound consequences for us. So we have about 10 minutes left, I see, and um, we want to take some uh, questions from the audience uh, that um, some of our uh, panelists can help to um, answer for you all. So let me just Oh, challenge my technology and look at the list of questions that we have here. And um, we do have a question. We'll ask this for Daniel. Do um, pecans work in the same way as walnuts? <laughs> so uh, pecans are good. Yes, yes. Eat pecans. Um, Again, we're focused more on the walnut because of um, the omega-3, omega-6 ratio, which is the best of all the tree nuts. And we're really interested in uh, omega-3 fatty acids. A lot of our research actually focuses on uh, eicosapentaenoic acid in, um, in DHA, uh, which, which is a, a, a metabolite. So 
pecans for sure are are of great benefit but but as far as ellagic acid and omega-3 i think walnuts even though they're not as tasty as pecans are probably the way to go nice and, and i know that in um there's a large trial it's called the Predimed trial and that was to um, look at participants at risk of cardiovascular disease and one of the interventions they did was um, they gave nuts to the participants and it was a, a combo of hazelnuts, almonds, and walnuts. So I think as long as you're on a team nut, you're, you're doing well. Fred, that's a very interesting trial, the Predimed. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and Dan, folks would like to know for the walnuts, does it matter if they're raw or roasted? <laughs> Now, now you're getting out of my uh, wheelhouse here, but um, I might defer to, uh, to, to maybe Brad or you, you, Jillian, as far as the best way to cook. Our study is just using um, uh, whole, whole shelled walnuts. Fre I mean, you will not get a better walnut than in this study because they come directly from California growers um, and they're in little packs. They're uh, one ounce is eat two of the packs a day, 52 grams a day total. Um, but they're uncooked and fresh. Uh, there are a lot of recipes. The, the California Walnut Commission provides all sorts of information on how to eat walnuts in different ways. But Brad might have a better sense as to whether you might kill any of the nutrients through cooking. Um, one thing you always have to be careful of is trying to be too perfect and I would much rather, if you're going to have the roasted nuts, is that going to be better than having, you know, your chips, you know, thousand percent. Better. So sometimes we have to be careful of trying to be too perfect. You know, they have shown with certain um, grilling and those type, they can exacerbate the cancer producing um, carcinogenic. But again, if you look at comparison to our processed foods, so for me, the roasted look better than the raw. The other thing is allowing your taste buds to change. It takes about 20 to 25 days. So if you have the roasted with the raw and then you gradually take them into just the raw, that would be more ideal. But you have to gradually do that like about a quarter every 30 days is usually what I do. So that way it allows those taste buds to adapt. And so you're not eating things you don't like. Excellent. We have another question here that talks about with greater consumption of plant-based foods, how much weight should be given to organically versus non-organically grown foods? And is it counterproductive to eat more vegetables, for example, if they are treated with pesticides and or fungicides? Great question, Brad. I... <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, if we look, if you're worried about the difference, you know, again, the ideal is going to be the organic. Um, if you're worried about the pesticides and that, um, you know, usually what I tell people, you know, plus the expense, if you can in about 50% water, 50% vinegar, let them soak for 20 minutes, and that will leach out quite a bit of the different chemicals in it and then rinse them well. Um, and, you know, again, we're trying to get too perfect sometimes. Um, one of the best ways when you look at helping your community, you keep it local. You go to the farm stands, um, you buy those type foods from them, and then you don't get the preservatives on the food coming from California, Mexico, or wherever that they've been sent for three weeks. So you know they have different chemicals to decrease that oxidation, the breakdown. Um, again, if you can get it where it's, you know, going bad quickly, that's usually something that's pretty good. I would agree with that. And it's also a great time to just be planning ahead that you can take the harvest uh, season, which we're in right now, and also freeze and or um, you know, process minimally, can some of those um, local products so that you have access to them um, you know, once the winter months come along. Um, I think that's one of my favorite things to do with um, all of the local blueberries that we have. Um, in all of our fields, but I mean, that's just one example of many. All right, let's see. 
We have a uh, we have a comment. Sunflower seeds are a dollar ninety nine per pound at Trader Joe's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it looks like we have a question um, asking about um, avoiding hard fats like palm and coconut um, versus the other types of fats. Um, one one of our um, audience members has asked that question and. And again, I think I, I'd be happy to discuss that, that really, um, you know, based on, you know, the newer data that has come out, um, and this is the, it's the Cochrane collaboration. It's a database that looks at big studies. Again, um, saturated fat is not linked to um, heart disease. It's really more complicated than just type of fat and heart disease. It's more the inflammatory picture. And so that really is looking at the idea of added sugars um, and excess weight and calories, um, kind of empty calories that folks are taking. But that being said, when you look at all of your fat sources, it <coughs> does, uh, you know, is a good practice to try to focus on some of those non-hard fats or those vegetable and um, seed and nut and avocado oils as a source because there is data that shows that they are definitely, um, you know, cardiovascular preventative. All right. Well, I think we're honestly at our one hour mark here. And so I'd like to just um, wrap it up by thanking all of our participants for joining in on our first discussion in this event series, which is uh, plant-based live and living. And I hope that everyone is leaving today with a greater understanding about plant-based diets and its role in um, food as medicine and medical benefits. We're going to have a short survey at the end of the program. Um, and we are going to have our next discussion is going to be um, plant-based nutrition specifically. So I, for one, definitely am so excited to have been made the connection with these great Yukon Health providers. And thank you so much for participating today, Brad and Molly and Daniel. And this was a great um, enlightening conversation. And I'm hoping that we will see everyone in October. Okay, be well, Yukon Nation. Go Huskies. Thanks Go so Huskies. Much. Go Huskies. <laughs> yeah.